we, we don't we don't really find many avenues for growth when we're sitting in the lap of comfort. When we see things that might, you know, uh, be a call to action for us and be someone that is doing something where you feel, well, I wish I was doing that, or I wish my this did that good, or I wish, but, you know, these, these are benchmarks. These are gifts that are given to us that are benchmarks for us to try to aspire to equal or better something. Yeah. And I think, I think these things get a bad rap, you know, people generally don't want to feel uncomfortable. And initially these are uncomfortable feelings, but what moves us to take action that may result in development or growth is being uncomfortable. I'm not comfortable with someone being this this much better than I am. Well, I better, pardon, pardon my language, I better get off my ass and do something about it. <laughs> good morning. Good morning, Anthony. Good, wow. or good evening. Yeah, almost good evening on my side and early morning for you. Yes. <laughs> well, it's great to meet you here on Zoom and you have your morning coffee there. Yes, yes, ma'am. Good. So you're ready. I am ready. I am ready for whatever you got. <laughs> well, I'm so grateful to Natalie uh, Featherston for introducing me to you or to talking about you. She talked mm. so highly of you and she was actually one of your students. No, 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 no. Natalie, uh, just a colleague. And oh. um, we, you know, the art world's not incredibly large. And mm -hmm. the, the people that work in similar circles kind of end up gravitating to each other. And um, I've been a fan. I've been a fan of Natalie's for many, many years. And we just really worked in uh, a, a shared genre that we both really are passionate about and i've been i consider her a, a a wonderful friend and an amazing colleague and someone that i'm very fortunate to have in my creative circle because you know she's she's she she brings a lot of insight to our conversations uh through her own experiences with sharing this genre with a very very wide audi audience her her works are incredibly popular and i know she has these amazing shows at present at the meyer gallery in santa fe and i know those shows are just blowouts you know she really? mm. uh you know she she finds um a great deal of her works are acquired uh, through that gallery and she's got a very big fan base she has a very big fan base overall but no never a student of mine um but a very valued colleague. Well, I because she said she learned so much from you, I just assumed uh, she was well, a student. I think we learned we learn from each other. You know, that's, oh, okay. she, she, she's being very kind when she says that we have a group on on Zoom mm. that we it's it started a few years ago and it really picked up steam during COVID when um People were really isolated and turning more and yeah. more to like Zoom and Skype to to eat, whether it was for work or for social interaction. And so we used to have this small group that met every other Sunday in on Sunday mornings and we just talked art and um, right around the time that, you know, the unfortunate uh you know, uh, uh, COVID kind yeah. of world, and we were we were pushed into quarantine. It seemed that a lot of people gravitated to this thing we were doing on Sundays, and uh, Natalie's a, a member of that. And we, you know, we we just kick around any any topics that we feel are relevant to the day, any any topical issues uh, we dive into. We have a very diverse group with a lot of different ideas. I mean, I would I would argue that. I, I think everyone that's in the group is a representationalist in some way that's working, you know, in, in, um, you know, the, a, an objective art form, but um, 
I, I think everyone learns from everyone. I wouldn't say that mm. there's one person that's just generally, you know, wiser or more knowledgeable than everyone else. It's a collective that really brings a lot of diverse perspectives and a lot of really, really valued experience that, you know, it, it, it just creates a nice wellspring to get some vetted information and some good experience-based insights. But it's interesting that you say that you, I mean, you you all learn from each other, but are there in the art world as competition amongst artists? Because I, in, in a way you must, you, you do your thing, but you must also look at other people, how they do it and then Sure. Is there envy no, I think and I, a little bit of oh, is that? No, there? but I, I think you know. I think envy and um, let's say envy or you know being intimidated by someone else's skill sets. I think those things get a bad rap. You know, I think being envious of what someone else might be doing can be a strong motivational force for what you're doing. And Actually, I yes. think, yeah. he, you know, I, and I, I think that some people look, unfortunately, because we're, you know, we're, we're, we're pushed towards wanting to feel better. We're, we're pushed towards, well, I want to get back to this comfortable homeostasis that I just feel good. And, you know, I'm very comfortable, but we, we don't, we don't really find many avenues for growth when we're sitting in the lap of comfort, when we see things that might you know, uh, be a call to action for us and be someone that is doing something where you feel, well, I wish I was doing that, or I wish my this did that good, or I wish, but, you know, these, these are benchmarks. These are gifts that are given to us that are benchmarks for us to try to aspire to equal or better something. Yeah. And I think, I think these things get a bad rap, you know, people, generally don't want to feel uncomfortable and initially these are uncomfortable feelings but what moves us to take action that may result in development or growth is being uncomfortable i'm not comfortable with someone being this this much better than i am well i better pardon pardon my language i better get off my ass and do something about it <laughs> you know so i i think these are yes, these are, right. these are good yeah. things, you mm. know but in, in all, I, I think we all try to do that. We all try to do something that will appeal to that particular type of dynamic with other artists. Like I want to do something that not only appeals to a wide audience in, in general, but I'd like to create things that make others that are colleagues in our in this shared journey like fellow travelers along this creative path i want to create something that will make them perk up and notice it like wow that's really impressive and one of the most beautiful comments that i get on a lot of social media content is from other creatives saying oh you inspired me to do this or you inspired mm -hmm. me to do that mm -hmm. and that that is a huge a, a, a huge builder of confidence in what you're doing you know and that really makes me feel amazing yeah and it's also when you speak to musicians or ballet dancers they they always feel that it's their colleagues or it's you know it's the the, the musicians feel or the pianist would feel that it's the other pianists who are their critics or their they they it's almost as if they want to impress them correct yeah. You. Correct. Yeah. But I I think I do want to, again, just emphasize, I think those things get a very bad rap when people mm -hmm. say it's not a competition. You know, you're just doing your own thing for you. And I get that those type of sentiments might be very valued for someone that might be in a in a realm of uh, being uncomfortable and you know, someone's just trying to comfort or offer some sentiments of solace. But honestly, <laughs> yeah, I, I usually don't agree with with um, mm. with with people saying it's not a competition. Well, 
it, it is in a sense that I'm using the endeavors of my colleagues as benchmarks for how I can make myself better. You know, I, I, I use their output uh, as a, a metric for how I might be able to improve. Think about what happens when you get inspired, mm -hmm. when you're looking to something and you get inspired whether it might be let's say for for a landscape painter it might be a beautiful field you know um, a, a beautiful waterfall or or a beautiful sunset something that we would describe as beautiful think about what happens then you want to you feel compelled to create something that approaches that experience okay and when we I don't know many people that would describe that land, you know, the 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 landscape they're viewing, the field, the waterfall, the sunset. I don't know many people that would describe that as you being envious of it. Yeah. But it's the same thing. When I see a beautiful painting, which I'm very fortunate to be connected to some amazing artists, especially in that Sunday Zoom. Uh, artist roundtable we have there's just some amazing artists in there and when i see some of their works i feel the same way as that landscape painter that might come along and see a beautiful sunset or a beautiful uh, lake and i think to myself wow that makes me want to create something that approaches that experience like i'm drawn to that and i want to emulate that and celebrate that somehow you know it, it, it's been we've we're, we're taught like oh no that's that's envy that's jealousy that's bad and you know this isn't a competition and so forth and so on and honestly a lot of my outlooks might not be the most popular outlooks but i like to think i arrived at these perspectives with with a rational consideration of what is the case and I, I think these things are, are to tell, to, 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 I think some of those things that, that the, the, these negative connotations and spins that are put on certain things may actually limit some creatives. And I think that's a problem. So if you feel that feeling when you see something like, oh my God, this painting, like I've been at shows before where I've seen a painting or I've seen a drawing or a sculpture that just makes you want to sit down and take a break for a second. Like, and just like, it's like you're hit with a big gust of wind or, um, you know, a big wave of heat where you're just like, Oh, I, it's just so incredibly gorgeous. It's stunning. And it, it hits all of these check boxes for me for something I would describe as immensely beautiful. And I think you, you start to think to yourself, I wish I could do that. Or you might even go even more negative where I'll never be able to do that. But there's part of you that tends to think, but I'm going to try. I'm going to try to do something like that. And I'm going to take what I can from this picture and uh, or this 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 piece of art. And I am going to try to infuse my own work with the elements that I think are most beautiful from this. And I think it's that practice for a social species, humans. I think it's that practice that elevates the whole activity that has it, um, you know, these creative pursuits. I think it elevates all of it. I think you're so right. And it's true that sometimes that. It's true that sometimes um, you get discouraged, you know, because you look at these things, like you say, you look at it, and then instead of thinking in this positive way, you know, thinking of that it's actually a positive, that you can rather get inspired by it and do maybe your own thing and, and your own uh, express yourself right. in, a, in a different way. So, but get inspired by this painting. Yes. Mm. So, but I am so fascinated by the trompe l'oeil. I have mm. been, uh, and and now 
the way you do it and the way Natalie does it as well. Uh, I only knew of it um, in these old churches and old, you know, um, buildings where, where you see that. And I never knew that it was being done this way, like you do it as well. Right. Um, well, like a lot of genres, um, there's there's a uh, there's a significant evolution to mm -hmm. Trump Loy that um, started in many of the types of contexts that you're you're talking about. But I would say, especially probably in the late 1800s is is where we see this culmination of this this crescendo of that genre leading to the probably the closest relative to what Natalie and I do now the 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 crescendo of that genre with artists like John Haberly uh William Michael Harnett uh Jefferson Davis Chafant um John Pato, it's these artists in the late 1800s that I think really are most well known for what Natalie and I do now. You know, uh, it, it's probably the closest uh, the the closest available relative to what we do. But yes, you are correct in that Trump Loy or what some people may colloquial, colloquially refer to as this type of illusionistic painting has a very, very rich evolution, a very rich history uh, going back uh, hundreds, if not in some cases, seemingly thousands of years. If if you did want to connect it uh, to to certain visual elements that were done, I mean, there's a, a the story of the the Greek painter uh, Zeuxis, who in the, and I'm, I'm not sure if Natalie mentioned this, because I know when maybe when she was talking about, if she was talking about the history of Trump Loy, um, there's the legend of this, I believe it was a 5th century uh, Greek painter Zeuxis, Z-E-U-X-I-S, I hope I'm saying it right. And, um, you know, the legend that surrounds him was that he was able to paint grapes so realistically on different surfaces that birds would swoop down and try mm -hmm. to, you know, mm -hmm. try to, to, uh, to grab these, these, uh, bits of fruit. And unfortunately, none of his, to the best of my knowledge, none of his work has survived. So now it just lives on in legend. So, you know how how quote unquote realistic it was i guess is is forever lost to uh to history but it's it's a it's a fascinating story and it uh it definitely served as inspiration for a number of my own works someone trying to create something that is so uh such a strong stimulus of a particular experience that you're able to again, quote unquote, fool nature into believing it's something that it's not. But what made you interested in Trump Loy? Well, when I was young, I was always very, very interested in things looking realistic. That just the the idea of something being realistic and something being realistic is a very complicated for some it's a very complicated concept i could say to you this looks very realistic that looks very realistic and colloquially speaking you would understand what i mean by that but when you really start to think about well what does that mean um does that mean that a drawing a representation a a simulation in some way holds kinship with an actual object. Not really. Okay. Because the fact of the matter is we humans have not evolved for what's called veridical vision. We don't see the world the way it is. We see, we have visual experiences that yield successful behaviors. You know, we, if we look to evolution 
uh, evolutionary psychology, biology, we see this. We're just, in fact, there's an interest, a, a very interesting uh, bit of work that has been done by a cognitive psychologist, Donald Hoffman, that ran a lot of simulations of different types of organisms uh, in 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 these environments. And it's interesting in his work, the if if a a organism was given the ability to sense the world around it in a veridical way as opposed to sensing the world around it in a way that just leads to successful behavior, putting the emphasis on the latter, if it was given the former, those things die off relatively quick. You know, they don't, they don't yeah. adapt very well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when, 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 when I was young, I was fascinated by drawings that I would, I would do that, you know, I would change the, change a line or change a mark or something. And it would somehow become more realistic and even when i was young i didn't i didn't really you know I, I didn't have the wherewithal to understand what that meant but i i wrote a, a paper that's available on my website called you know what what does realistic look like mm -hmm. and it's it's an interesting question to ask yourself to help challenge some of your assumptions which ultimately will govern some of your perceptions and some of the things that keep us locked into a state of petered out development where we're not really growing and changing in a positive way when we're not developing in the way we want to it's because that we have not uh, one of the reasons that that may be the case is that we're not really challenging the assumptions that we hold which are governing the perceptions that we experience so when i was you know, when I was young and I started changing certain certain things about my drawing and I thought, hey, that looks more that looks more realistic. Again, not really understanding exactly what I meant by that, but just with the colloquial understanding. And for me, it was drawing dinosaurs. I was I would love drawing dinosaurs, mm -hmm. but they would always be that, you know, one dimensional side profile view of a dinosaur. Yeah. And then I realized, well, if I if I move a line here. All of a sudden, the legs of the dinosaur went back and this other set of legs came forward, you know, um, seemingly. And to me, that all of a sudden, just the addition of that one line, that became more realistic. And that was, I'll never forget that experience. That was such a revelation to me. And I write about this in this, in this paper, this whole experience of drawing dinosaurs. And as I got older... I really liked the challenge of trying to find different visual elements that I could add to different drawings or different paintings that might nudge it in that direction, that might have me recapture that excitement of adding that one line to a little sketch of a dinosaur that all of a sudden made it more realistic. So, you know, fast forward many years later when I was, you know, in college going to school for art and I had a teacher that uh, organized a trip up to New York to the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And it was actually, I hadn't been to, I'd been to the Smithsonian and whatnot when I was younger, but I had never gone to the Met. And so it was my first trip there. And I remember walking out on the American, in the American wing out on a mezzanine. And seeing these paintings that gave me that same feeling I talked about early on where it just oh, put me right in my seat. And what it, what it was, it was the trompe l'oeil painters of the late 1800s. It was uh, paintings by Pato and uh, John Haberly, who was a, a huge inspiration to me, and William Michael Harnett. And these guys were painting things that looked incredibly realistic in the sense that it looked like I was looking at a scene that had the actual objects as opposed to a representation. It took that that one step removed and brought you a little bit closer where you know you're looking at a painting but if you if you concentrate to suspend your 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 um awareness just a little bit try to force change that assumption 
that you're looking at a painting. It, these things were just an incredible experience of simulated reality. And linking that all the way all the way back to when I was a kid and put that little line on the dinosaur, I thought, you know, this this is a much later version of that where this is the next big step that I I this is the next big thing I want to chase. Mm-hmm. And I I've been I've been trying to give people these Trump Loy experiences ever since. Trying to let other people share in that same magic moment that I did when I added that one little line to a dinosaur when I was very, very young. That's amazing. And it's it's so amazing that you it this also always fascinates me. What is that one thing that triggered it? You know, that one thing that inspires this whole um idea for you that this is what you want to do. I'm very fortunate in that I remember it. I remember it in first, it was just, uh, um, you know, I think I was given a lot of art materials Mm -hmm. and by art materials, I mean, pens, pencils, and paper when I was young, because I had a very clever grandmother, uh, a very clever, uh, uh, actually both my grandmothers were, were clever in this way because I was probably a very rambunctious child and they didn't want us me my my brother and my sister messing up their house so wow. they would say here sit here at the table and draw pictures and this way we're not running around the house or jumping on the furniture or anything like that so they were very they were very clever they're like oh look how much fun it is to draw and so you know we 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 would we would draw with you know pens pencils crayons and and we would draw and draw and draw for hours and hours and hours. And so eventually you start drawing pictures or even initially you could start drawing pictures of things you liked. And that was one of the things I was into at the time was these dinosaurs. And But I would always draw them in this very, very two-dimensional uh, flat, flat land kind of way. And um, at a certain point, it was when I, I started making these marks that started to change the nature of the representations. And for me, I I thought I I want to learn more about this. And, you know, I would start looking for other ways to make these things look again, quote unquote, realistic. But you've also now with a, with a Trump lawyer, you it's, it's um, not the same as the, like the paintings that you talked about. Now you did it differently. You use objects and uh, it looks almost as if they are in little frames and so on. Mm-hmm. So what was mm-hmm. the idea there? How did you get to that idea? Well, just like I, I, I mentioned before, you see um, you see certain things that make you want to gravitate towards mm-hmm. some bit of brilliance you might have seen before. Again, whether it was an actual beautiful scene in nature or whether it was a beautiful person that you met that you know makes you want to be better at something or or chase this bit of beauty or majesty that you experience and i remember seeing uh some brilliant art uh artists i know um you know you may know the art artist joseph cornell who did these beautiful little uh box assemblages that were 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 beautifully uh crafted And I remember seeing those and thinking, oh, I would love to create something like that. That is this very diverse collection of textures and bits of ephemera and small little trinkets that might mean something to us that we would hold on to. And I want to build these these little these little dioramic worlds in these little boxes. But instead of just doing that then I want to be able to paint it in a way where it looks like you're looking at that. And that was, that was really, um, you know, and, and, and other, you know, other, uh, I could extend that to other things that I've done that, that were inspired in some way by an experience I had, Again, whether it be an, an an actual object I may have come across in the environment or that I was inspired by, 
or another artist doing something that I was incredibly inspired by. And usually these things get all woven together. And and then what's what's the nature of creativity? The nature of creativity is very simple. And you ask a lot of people, how would you define creativity? And they long-winded, very esoteric um, definitions and explanations that border on mysticism and but it's creativity is actually something very, very simple. It's 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 create it's 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 an association. You're connecting you're connecting two things together that may be seemingly disparate, but you found a way to connect them. And that's one of the things humans. One of the really impressive things about humans is metaphors, because that's a beautiful exercise in creativity. You're you're, you're comparing something uh, that to most people might not have any noticeable connection whatsoever along any set of criteria. But, you know, creativity is I, I see uh, something and I am inspired and then I connect it to something else over here in my studio and I make something new and someone sees that and they did not have, and creativity is really for the person engaged in the creative act it's a small thing it's a little step it's a little nudge it's a little eh. but the people that are looking on this looks like an incredibly disparate connection an association um you know and it's usually someone that has had a set of experiences that have led these two things closer and closer together one story i tell is you know imagine a guy going out on a fishing boat you know going out on a little rowboat to to do some fishing and his son left a rubber ball in the in the boat and as he's out um thing he notices there's a little hole that he hits a rock out in the lake somewhere and water starts coming in the boat and he notices that the little as he's moving around trying to decide what to do the little ball starts rolling around in the boat and then kind of just goes in the hole and he realizes, okay, that's starting to to uh, attenuate some of the, the the amount of water rushing in, you know. So he pushes the ball down a little more, and it just it seals the boat long enough for him to get back to shore. So the next time he's out fishing, he keeps that little ball in his tackle box, and the next time he's out fishing, something happens with a bunch of his friends uh, in in this little boat, and the same thing happens where they hit another rock and a little you know, some water starts rushing and everyone starts freaking out. And the guy takes the ball out of the tackle box and puts it in the hole. And they're like, wow, what a creative solution to that problem. But for the guys, you know, from his perspective, it was something he experienced in the past where he's like, oh, yeah. look, that'll fit. And that's a small little step for him. But for the other people looking on, they're like, wow, this is a huge creative uh, what a what a genius! What a brilliant thing! What the brilliant creative! So, while someone looking on, like you might look on at my work or Natalie's work and say, "Wow, it was so creative to come up with this," but actually, for us, it's just little nudging little things together that might not have been previously associated. Yeah, that what a great story! Yeah, and 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 it makes me think that it's true. You know that you yeah. think. You you think because I saw your paintings as well, and I think how did you get this? Because I love that you use such basic objects, but then right. you put them together, and it's just so amazing what it looks like. Then, and I would never have thought to put these things together. Well, think about what the nature of you know the, when we talk about realism we could talk ab about it as a descriptor for a certain type of representation or we could talk about it in terms of it being an you know a a a um a genre or an age or uh a a category of a historical uh of uh, uh, uh category of of painting you know like with corbet realism came around where prior to that a lot of painting was lofty. It was very, very, very huge, big ideas. But when realism came came around, it's not that it wasn't really big ideas, but rather than using ver the the subjects that were very lofty and and um, 
incredibly esoteric, I guess you could say, the 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 birth of realism seemed to be about the elevation of the mundane to to something more lofty. It was taking what was around everyday people and and imbuing it in the way that it's communicated with something absolutely incredible, absolutely um, beautiful, you might say, is taking something that's just average and or or uh, banal or, or like I said, mundane, boring, mediocre, pedestrian, and making it into something incredibly special. Mm-hmm. And you know, to me, that's a that's a that's that's a very impressive thing. That's 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 virtuosity that I'm attracted to. You know, we 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 have a tendency, and this this can be this you know this can be a, a, a very argued um, thought here that you know when we are assigning, when we are assigning beauty to something, when we are assigning a um, a level of virtuosity to something that we're we're experiencing. There's definitely a consideration of perceived difficulty. Like how hard was it to do this? Okay, what what type of difficulty did someone overcome? Yeah. And sometimes we might see a picture and have one experience Experience and then learn something about the artist or the painting, its provenance, its history that makes us think, wow, they really had to overcome a lot or uh, this painting had gone through this, this historical, uh, th- th- this, this series of past events that just make it somehow far more incredible, far more beautiful. And I think for me, this this is is readily evident when we look at someone trying to elevate something that is very mundane. You know, it's one thing to maybe let's <clears throat> to, to to have something look majestic, like a big angelic figure painting. Okay, we were trying to make something look very very majestic and noble and 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 beautiful in, in that way but how much can i can i take something like let's just say a playing card or you know a piece of fruit can i elevate it to that same level can i take something incredible mundane and raise it to that and for me that's a big source of beauty because I think that's very difficult to do is to take something very, and I'm very attracted to that challenge. Mm-hmm. I am so attracted mm-hmm. to that challenge of, of taking something that, because I get people all the time where even in those little boxes you mentioned, I might have like some, some really old toys that are all like maybe uh, have a lot of character. They've been, they've been dinged up and they have a lot of history and marks and stains and dents. And somebody will look at that and be like, oh, my God, I had that same little toy when I was a little boy or girl. And, you know, that nostalgia brings them to it. But it's a lot of work. Uh, and, you know, it's it's something that I, I hope that I, I'm getting better and better and better at doing is taking this very, very mundane thing and elevating it to that same type of of majesty that you might see in paintings that have more uh lofty subject matter you know and that's that's again that's a challenge i really i really like getting my teeth into but do you think also uh there's this perception that you really have to it's almost as if people want to shock to get attention or that artists feel oh yeah really do something extravagant to and and shock people to get that publicity and that these things that you're doing, because I find it really so beautiful that it's so these ordinary things, like you say, with the playing card and 
and these these uh, I think there's the one with the is, is it a trumpet or something and an apple yeah. that yeah. you have there. And I think, wow, you know, it's so it's it's so well, simple. Yet it is is stunning. And um that that we t- tend to think you have to do something really out there um instead of looking yeah. at the you know, but it's it's the same thing like look there's there are many different styles of music you know there's there's jazz and there's rock and blues calypso music polka and fusion and so many different types of music and there's a seemingly colloquially infinite type of ways to interact with the activity that we might loosely describe as music and sure some people may want to get noticed and play something that is you know really really shocking in terms of what the music is saying or the way that it's being played sure i I mean you may you may get noticed at first if something is shocking but it really is going to depend on the provenance and the appeals to our you know aesthetic preferences as a species you know, if it's going to have, if it's going to have some type of staying power. So I've seen people that have done some very, very shocking work in terms of subject matter. And, you know, some of it gets noticed and some of it flounders and just kind of stays quiet. It does seem in a world now in the, the, I think what we're still calling the information age where people are inundated with imagery there's imagery everywhere i mean every every smartphone now has an enormous amount of um images on it you have you, something some people have thousands and thousands of images on their phone or access to them via the internet with their phone so yeah some sometimes people feel that well i have to get noticed So I'm going to do something very, very, very shocking. But for the people that are choosing different types of music and the people that are choosing different types of art, where is, where is being noticed on your, Mm. on your, your, your criteria? Mm. Where is that? You know, some people, we were just talking in that Sunday group the other day about some people saying, well, when you're painting, it's best to do this. Why is that? Because your painting will last the longest. Okay. It will, or it will, it'll have the greatest chances for longevity. And that's, you know, some people, this is the best thing you could do. And I said, well, think about that word best. Okay. Think about that word best. Think about some types of artwork that are far more transient. Think about like when someone does a sand painting, like they're meant to 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 dissipate quickly. I'm not saying that should be the same thing for painting, but longevity is not at the top of that chart. Yeah, you know, some people might use different types of paints and mediums and whatnot that bring a great amount of fulfillment or allow them to do certain things that they really find artistically compelling that they want to share with other people. But it may not be the absolute best in terms of allowing that painting to last the longest. Look, I mean, uh, we, we we could take something from the, I, I believe it's the, the, the pioneer space missions. Like if we wanted to make imagery that's going to last the longest, let's just, you know, etch them onto some gold records and fire them into space. There, they'll last the longest. And that'll last longer than any painting on this planet. But is that really what I want to do? Mm-hmm. You know, so in in the same way, when we're when we're getting to 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 paintings and drawings and other creative acts, where is getting noticed on your criteria? You know, for me, I don't want to have to paint shocking things to get attention. That idea is overshadowed by other priorities that I have that, that are still might appeal to me to the the task of me getting attention 
but it's not necessarily um, first and foremost on the list. So uh, trying to be shocking, which I understand, like I said, we're, we're in an age where we're inundated with imagery and there's so much noise. We sometimes think we have to scream out something vile to be heard. Yeah. And sometimes something vile is sometimes something vile is, uh, um, you know, exactly what we, we need in, in the, the art sphere to challenge some set of assumptions that we may have to maybe alter our perceptions about certain things. And art, art is good at that, you know, mm -hmm. and sometimes I think that's a, that's, that's a very, very good thing, but I think it could also be very limiting if you feel the only way oh, you yeah. can get attention is to be shocking because that's one that that's one tool in your arsenal, but I don't think you need that. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the images that I see behind you, I would describe as attractive images, but I don't think, but um, even though I'm talking with you, I notice them, but not because they're shocking, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, actually it's, they're, they're nice images, mm. um, but I do notice them. You're talking about the heart. The heart, yes. <laughs> Is it something my, you did? My mom made it for me. Oh, well, there you Many go. Many years ago. And um, yeah, it's just very special to me. And it's it's really just a coincidence that it's at the back of me. But yeah, you noticed it. <laughs> but that's the thing. Now, yeah. you've just changed my experience of that heart you know because you gave me another bit of information and something i talk about um relatively often is the nature of the art experience and this whole thing came up again when you know the all these ai text to image generators came out and uh everyone started asking about you know well what is art really and you know one thing that we have to address is that it's it's not what we understand as art is something that happens in here not out there it's it's the the paintings and drawings that we point to serve a very important purpose because they are the they are um you could say they're a conduit or what i like to say is they're more like software you know that's running on hardware you know we see um an image and you know it it runs on our our neural hardware and it yields uh, a certain bit of neural activity that we have a first person view of that that whole experience we call art and um but in the same way we we point to a painting or we point to a drawing that that we we uh, in, we we have in our environment we say well that's art but in the same way i could take this my my Halloween coffee mug here, and yeah. I can point to this and say this is green, but mm -hmm. this isn't green. Green is in here. Mm -hmm. You know, this has a certain uh, surface property that absorbs certain wavelengths of light and reflects others. And I have a certain biology that when it engages with certain wavelengths, it unfolds a certain cascade of neural activity that I have a first person experience of as the color green, but green's not out there. Green's in here, but day-to-day -day conversation, it's very useful for me to point to that mug and say, can you please hand me that green mug? Oh, yeah. Even though the mug's not green, mm -hmm. it, it happens in here and art art's the same way. We point, well, look at this beautiful art over here, but the art's actually happening in here. Mm -hmm. But needless to say, we could change, we could change something we could change aspects of the different subroutines that's running on the hardware. And I could look at that heart image prior to you letting me know it's something beautiful. That's very special from your mother. It's something very important to you has a lot of sentimental value, but now that you're giving me that information, I can relate to that. Now you're changing that experience for me. You're helping build that art into something more than it might've been five minutes ago. And that's an interesting thing. Yeah, but do you think this is the reason also why it's important for artists to talk about their art, to what about what inspired this art? Absolutely, a hundred percent. In fact, I would say you're becoming an active participant in someone's art experience. Then, mm -hmm. but you know, in, in a different way than just presenting. <coughs> pardon me, than just presenting the the art itself. 
in 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 like well if i and you've probably seen this before where there, there'll sometimes be a video of a world renowned cellist or violinist that uh they they put like in a subway terminal playing Oh, and yeah, yeah. most people just walk right by. Some people mm -hmm. will stop and listen. But this musician might be someone where if they are in the appropriate venue, you can't get tickets for this person because they're sold out for months. And now, you know, but context is very, very important. And what you're bringing to the experience in terms of your assumptions and perceptions is extraordinarily important to the end product. So I think that... Uh, when you take a painting and if I put a painting in, you know, if I hung up a little picture on my refrigerator um, and let's say I had a party and, you know, uh, 20 people came to this party, saw this picture on the refrigerator, maybe or maybe saw it in my kitchen somewhere. And if those same 20 people happen to be at a big show opening in a very prestigious gallery and saw that same painting there, even not knowing anything about the painting, me telling them anything about it, um, they would have very different experiences with that image based on where it was. So oh, yeah. on top of that, you know, you're, you're just changing one of the contextual elements uh, that is, is um, contributing to that neural cascade that we're experiencing. And the same way is that if you tell me about something or an artist talks about their work or what they're trying to do or what they're hoping to do, um, people that might now hear this story and think, you know, why Chulis really got started by just making a tiny line on a dinosaur drawing that made him realize, hey, this looks more realistic. And then when he saw the Trump Loy painters from the late 1800s in the American wing of the Metropolitan out on the mezzanine there, that was the equivalent of that. And that's what he's trying to do in his work. Now, when people come back to my work, they might see it a little bit differently. Definitely, yeah. So this is very important. Mm -hmm. Another thing that people get excited about, which might change how uh, I, I could change how you look at my artwork in a second, mm -hmm. and I'm going to do I'm going to do that right now for you yeah, here on this podcast. So strap okay. in. Here we go. Yeah. Okay. When Love I was it. a child, when I was a child, I was also a very big fan of the author Douglas Adams. Mm -hmm. And he wrote the books, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And they're very, very funny books. Very funny books. And in the story, there is a reference to a certain number. Mm -hmm. And the story goes just in, in a, a very, very short, a short, uh, short version, is this race of people build a computer. And this computer is supposed to give them the answer to life, the universe, and everything. And they call it the ultimate answer. And it's going and the, the, the it takes millions of years for this computer to run this program. And so when when the ancestors of the people that built it come back and ask the computer, what's the answer? The computer says 42. And that's that's the funny part. It's like, you know, it's yeah. Yeah, you know, yeah. It, it's it's a very very unexpected answer. Like, well, what does that mean? You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. the computer responds, "Well, you know, it's the the issue is that we don't really have a clear question, so you mm -hmm. have to build another computer that's going to help create the question, so the forty two oh, will okay. make more sense." Mm -hmm. And I thought that was so funny, mm -hmm. and it's just funny that there's this number that is associated with the ultimate answer to everything. Now, for me, an essential part of my being is my painting, what I do. I mean, that's part of who I am, These, the, this, this activity that I am just compelled to engage in every single day. And I thought, wouldn't it be funny to hide this number in every single painting I do? Yes. So in every yes. painting I've really? ever created, there's a number four and a number two hidden somewhere. Oh, I'm going to have a look. Right. And now I've <laughs> just see. changed the way you will look at every painting I've ever done. Yeah. That's amazing. But yeah, yeah. it makes it, and, and that makes it so um, 
I, I mean, it, not that your paintings itself are interesting and, and that I saw, but now it's going to be sort of very intriguing to go something and have a, a little look. different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's amazing. Yeah, this is this is a great story. <laughs> mm. I'm glad you liked it. Yeah, no, I love things like that. But Anthony, you um, you teach as well. You correct. Yes. Yeah. So uh, why do you teach? What is it about teaching? Well, I'll be honest. I had no interest whatsoever in being a teacher. I did not want to teach. I did not like painting around people. Um, And it wasn't a thing where, you know, some people I know will teach just to, um, you know, make ends meet. They'll, Mm -hmm. they'll, They'll take a job as an instructor that, you know, it helps them to reinforce their own again, their own assumptions about what they're, what they're doing or to challenge some of their assumptions about what they're doing. Um, but when I was at, in art school, uh, a, a funny phenomena started happening when I was in art school where I would go to school during the day and all I did was paint. I didn't go anywhere. I had, there was, there was no social life. There was just painting. There was painting and drawing. That was it for years. And what my what 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 started to happen is in 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 school, some people started noticing what I was doing. And you know, it would start out with just someone leaning over. How, how did you do that right there? How how did you do that thing right there that you did? I'd say, Oh, well, I just did this. And you know, that would have that started to happen more and more often as you know, months went on when I was there. And then one day someone just said, do you mind if I just like come over and hang out in your studio? Cause you're, you, you paint after school. I said, yeah, I, I paint until I get tired and go to bed. And they said, well, I'm, I'm like, do you mind if I come over and just watch what you're doing? And then another person heard that that first person did that. And they said, well, Hey, can I come along and, and watch this? Blah, blah, blah. And before you knew it, it wasn't irregular to have, even two or three up to as many like a tiny apartment yeah. up to like five and six people jammed into this tiny apartment that mm. were watching me paint and draw and asking me questions all the time. And I probably gravitated to it because it was, it was a little bit of social interaction, you know, otherwise uh, I, I would just be painting by myself with just listening to music and working. And what I started to notice too, is that, you know, selfishly, some of the questions that I was being asked helped me to, again, challenge some of the assumptions I had about what I was doing when I had to articulate it. Like, okay, what what do I really mean by this? And if I change the way that I'm, ex- if, if the way that I'm explaining it to someone else changes the way that I'm perceiving what I'm doing, I could try more variations of the actual thing that I'm doing, you know, the action itself. And that was a really, um, that was that was a really fascinating thing for me as well. Like as I'm trying to explain this to people, it's it's challenging me to um, put a microscope on the way that I understand it. So this started to happen more and more and more and more, and I started to enjoy just sharing what I was doing more and more and more. But again, selfishly, it was developing my ability to comprehend to comprehend what I was doing. Cause a lot of times we could memorize steps of something, but do yeah. you comprehend what those steps are contributing? What the, the role of any particular piece of a process or um, some procedure, how is that really impacting? How is that contributing? And the more you comprehend about each uh, component the more you could take control over the entire process itself by altering, changing, augmenting, pruning, all these different aspects of each individual component into this very, very complex um, symphony of micro activities that are contributing to the big thing. So when I, um, uh, when I was finished with college and art school and I returned to my hometown right after uh right after that I decided well I'm going to open up a studio and as soon as people found out that I had returned to the area that uh, I lived in the area that I teach in now 
I was inundated with people asking me if they could study with me. Mm -hmm. And I thought, okay, you know, uh, but at that point, again, selfishly, it wasn't so much for the money. It was because I found that I was developing more efficiently and effectively in the way that I wanted having the daily exercise of reevaluating everything was I was doing. And in turn, that helped me a great deal. And it also ensured that the information that I was giving to people was the most vetted, I guess, information that I could give to someone. And I was not dogmatic in any way with what I was teaching. It was, you know, I had a very empirical dynamic, uh, you know, because there's a lot of claims in art education about this and that and how this works and how that works. And I was constantly testing all of that because I was surrounded by people that were asking me, how does this work? Why does this work? Why do we do this? Why do we do that? And I was very, very fortunate to have the artists that wanted to study with me um, ask that type of question, be uh, questions, be incredibly inquisitive, incredibly inquisitive people. And so uh, then I was, I think I was back two weeks and the college that I had attended here called me and offered me a, a, a faculty position there. Uh, could you come here and teach what you're doing? And I said, okay, yeah, I could do that. Wow. And mm-hmm. uh, then it it grew and grew. And the what 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 had been my private studio, the Waichula Studio, got uh, you know was very successful. And I was uh, you know helping uh, a, a a great number of dedicated creatives to realize what they wanted to do and then in 2010 i uh, met an artist named timothy jan and he was working with a gentleman in new jersey who is a, a very passionate uh art patron and really wanted to learn how to paint himself and he was a very very successful a uh, Wall Street guy, you know, he uh, he founded a very successful Wall Street firm, and his firm had a strong educational uh, component where he would teach a lot of uh, newcomers to the financial arena um, how to be more successful. So he was a very big proponent of very very strong education in what he did professionally. And because of his love of the arts, he wanted to open up art schools in other oh, places wow. all over the world mm-hmm. that were all free, no tuition. And so um, at that time, Timothy Jan, the artist I met, had told this individual by the name of Tim Reynolds what I was doing and how successful my program was. And then he asked if he could meet me. So we had a very, very important meeting one day. And he asked me if I would want to create the curriculum for these schools uh, wow. that were going to be all over the world. And I said, yes, I would do that. And uh, this was the Ani Art Academy's project that he did. And now we have six schools in five countries Amazing. that are, um, we have uh, a, a little... My, my my request was I just want to keep a little studio in in the neck of the woods where I got started, and that's in northeastern Pennsylvania. In fact, we're in Bear Creek Township in northeastern Pennsylvania, and it is as rural as it sounds. And I love it. I am <laughs> I am embedded in the forests, Petra. Oh in, wow, in that's amazing. Uh, but the other yeah. the other schools um, are there's there's a uh, a small school in, also in New Jersey, but all the other ones are these big campuses that uh, one is we have in Thailand, one we have in Sri Lanka, uh, two we have in the Caribbean, one in the Dominican Republic, and one in Anguilla, uh, and these schools are. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're incredible campuses that are run by former graduates of my curriculum that are 
incredibly skilled at what they do. They are not only brilliant artists, but they are wonderful uh, individuals in terms of conveying information in a meaningful way to give a lot of these aspiring creatives in areas where there might not really be the type of artistic opportunities, creative opportunities that they may want. And um, it's it's been an amazing journey. This project started in 2010, and we have uh, an amazing, an amazing legacy that has unfolded already. And this is all thanks to this, this individual, Tim Reynolds, that gave birth to this amazing idea. And he's Wonderful. donated an enormous amount of resources. Um, I mean, there, there's, uh, you know, the, a lot of these, like all their materials are free. There's no tuition. Mm -hmm. uh, everything's a full merit scholarship. You just have to work mm -hmm. at what you're doing. You know, you have to attend the school and really work hard at the exercises mm -hmm. and the the output from these students is just it's that same experience I talked about in the beginning it just puts me down in the chair and this is you know it's it's almost like um uh uh the, the impossible self-sustaining machine but it's the closest metaphor I could think of because my life has unfolded in a way where uh, sharing all the knowledge I have has become an important part of what I do every day. But now the works that these artists that I've helped to develop is now serving as inspiration for the things I will continue to do. Wow, yeah. So it's, it's really come full circle in a way where I am extraordinarily grateful in myriad ways. Mm -hmm. Well, I get so excited when I hear about projects like this because I think it's also so important that we, I think art and artists can only be valued if we, if it's part of education, if art is part of education and music and all forms of art really. And I think, you know, t uh, teaching or learning an art form, uh, you don't necessarily have to become a painter or a musician but it does have something to do it just it gives you a skill set that you otherwise wouldn't have had you know and and um and, and I it's think part of, that, listen it's it's part of what we are exactly it's it's, it's part yeah. of what we are you know fundamentally mm -hmm. uh art music literature and by art i mean visual art yeah uh, you know uh these things are 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 they're they're spandrels mm -hmm. okay um do you know what a spandrel is in architecture yeah. so if if you have if you have arches mm -hmm. right next to each other lined up in architecture you have a whole bunch of art arches and i think steven pinker coined this uh connect connected these two ideas a little bit of creativity on his part so he made this association so when you have several arches in a row think about the shape that occurs at the top of the arch you get a little triangle between each arch there's a little triangle at the top now architects didn't design for this triangle the triangle just is there because of the arches okay if you put the arches next to each other the triangle shows up it just is a result of the arches Art, the arts, can be looked at that way. It's a spandrel. Yeah. It mm -hmm. because of the different aspects of our lives, um, because of our what what could be called our phylogenetic history. Okay, the experiences of our species as a whole. Okay, um, if you look at all those experiences, art just shakes out of that. Art becomes a thing. It's a pleasure technology. I know Pinker does talk about cheesecake. He talks about art as cheesecake. Really? And it's something we create because it's the it's the best of us. Mm -hmm. And if you look at cheesecake and you think, as humans, we have a strong predilection for fats and sugars. Mm -hmm. It's a good thing. 
So we didn't we didn't evolve to love cheesecake, but what we did was we evolved to love all these things. And then we took all these things and mashed them into one decadent dessert that we call cheesecake. Yeah. And it's the true. best of all these things we love and we mash yeah. it all together. And art the arts mm. are the best of us all mushed together. So if you want to know what it is to be human, look to the arts because that is the pleasure technology that represents the best of us. I love your analogies. <laughs> Good. I'm glad. I hope I hope your listeners like them. They will definitely do. <laughs> Good, good. But Anthony, um, tell me what's the wish? The wish? Mm. You For have myself? To, you have, yeah, you have to make a wish here because... My channel is known for making wishes come true for some reason. <laughs> my wish, my wish would be that. Let's see. I want to. I want to give this a little bit of thought because I want to make it a good wish. Yeah. I wish that. more people might take a moment each day to challenge one of the assumptions that they hold to see if it might open up all new perspectives for them. I don't want to make a wish that something so esoteric it couldn't happen. That could happen. Yeah. yeah. Take, take, take a moment. They're not esoteric, grandiose. But I take a moment each day and think about there's a, a an astrophysicist named Lawrence Krauss. And he was telling a story once uh in a lecture that I was listening to. And he said he wishes for all his freshman students when they're that during the course of their adventures in academia, he hopes that they all encounter something that will challenge one of the most basic assumptions they hold. And he said he wants it to shatter their world. Wow. Now, he's not a sadist, he's, yeah. but he wants this to happen because he thinks that experience will open a door to true learning, that there's no dogmatic shield that could hold out new information for changing the way you might see the world, see others, see what you do, see what others do. And if we're not afraid to do that, if we're not afraid to do that, I think that society as a whole might become a lot more understanding of what others yeah. do and more be willing to engage more new ideas and might cause a lot of people to not be so quick and dismissive of one another's viewpoints. So I would say if I had one wish, I would wish that people just took a moment each day to think about something, some assumption that they've held for a long time and think, well, why do I believe that? Why, why do I believe that to be true? And just think about it. And uh, I think a lot of good things can come from that. Absolutely. And what an unselfish wish. Ah, well, <laughs> it, it, not really, because if it makes if it makes everything a lot better for everyone, I'm included in that. So there's a oh, little. Okay. Oh, okay. 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 But you you've you've just in in this interview uh, changed one of my assumptions, and that is about the what we talked about in the beginning about thinking of the competition or thinking of yeah you know something like that i i never thought of that but yeah it's really true and and i think it's the moment you can make that switch and change your mind about how you look at it you can really get more inspired yeah and that 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 um, means that means a great deal to me uh mm -hmm. that you 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 shared that with me because that you know to me that's that that's gifts we can give each other all the time yeah, you know, is mm -hmm. a, a different perspective, a different 
uh, a different way of looking at something or even a challenge to, like I said, one of your assumptions that might be, wow, you've opened up a new way that I could look at something. And, yeah. you know, that's, that's, that's a gift that'll stay with us. Mm. No, that's so. true. Anthony, this was so great. Oh, it was this fun. Was so enjoyed- lovely talking to you. Really. I'm, I'm so sorry that I got into a coughing fit in the beginning. No, and- no, no. For your for your listeners, um, Petra is probably going to edit it out, but I was coughing a whole bunch, and uh, Petra was so kind to me and told me to take my time, take my time. So whatever you see as the final result, there's a good seven minutes or so where I'm coughing and hacking, and uh, Petra's probably thinking, "My God, what have I gotten myself into?" No, no. <laughs> Listen, I've had many things last week. I had a bee and a bee kept uh, in the screen the whole time. And yeah, so Uh, it's these things happen. But this is what I love about Zoom, you know. Well, Uh, thank you for being so kind and understanding. Yeah, no, I think it's so it's normal and it's natural and I love it really. So, yeah. I hope and I was an least, okay. I hope I was an okay guest. You were great, and at least I know you can cough. I know what your cough sounds like. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. <laughs> okay, but Anthony, have a wonderful day that's ahead of you. Yes, ma'am. Yes. And thank you so much for your time, and thank it's you so much. It's my pleasure. For it was it was a real privilege and an honor to spend some time talking art with a fellow creative. And I really appreciate it. It's a great pleasure. And whenever you come to Vienna, you will have to let me know. I will definitely do so. Yeah, I'll have... come and I will see that heart piece in person. Oh yes, definitely. Yeah. Now I've, yes. I've actually photographed over 300 hearts here in Vienna, all the graffiti mm. hearts I photographed because I love it. I love Oh Wow. I love the fact that, you know, graffiti, for me, graffiti, sometimes, you know, I think I look at these old historical buildings and when they have graffiti on, I think to myself, this is, the building is an artist. It's the, the, the creator of this building or the architect of the building was an artist or is an artist. And I think sometimes when the graffiti is on the walls, then I think, okay, for me, it's, a bit sometimes heartbreaking that you know this piece of art is there's something like that on and when I did my project during lockdown um it was something that I thought about a lot and then I thought okay but I have the choice what I look at and I must look and see if I can find something beautiful within the graffiti and then because I love hearts I started noticing all the hearts in the between the graffiti well this is it you've ch- you challenged an assumption about yeah. something you did and you 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 found a way to alter your perception so that you focused exactly. on something beautiful within it yeah That's and so amazing. I, yeah i discovered all these hearts and you know what it also made me think is that we choose what we see it's it's our choice how we see things so you know, if you you can look at everything in 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 a certain way, or you can find something in it that's beautiful. So yeah. uh, that's really you know made me realize that. So well, what a what a perfect story for you to offer at the end of this. Perfect. Oh, I'm glad you liked it. Perfect. <laughs> the right person for the story. I right. Think. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> okay, so you'll have to come to Vienna and let me take you through the streets and so- show you all the I would love parts. it. I would love yeah. it. Okay. Okay, Anthony. See you soon. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. <laughs>